It is important to understand when thinking about the authority of governments in the American system, there are two distinct but not unrelated considerations. The first is what the law permits and requires. The second is what the political agenda of the time demands or precludes. Nowhere is the interplay of these two considerations more apparent than when considering the authority of local governments. The American political culture has been historically, and remains today, one that places a premium on the rule of law. The question about what is legally valid, legally permissible, or legally prohibited is paramount. With that in mind, we should begin by stating that as a matter of legal principle, local governments draw their authority not from the citizens they govern, but from the government that established them, the state. This legal doctrine was developed by the 19th century jurist John F. Dillon, and thus has come to be known as Dillon's Rule. Dillon served as Chief Justice of the Iowa State Supreme Court. The rule, developed by Dillon in 1868, has subsequently come to be accepted as the definitive interpretation of local power, or perhaps the lack of local power. Dillon's rule is based upon the concept of ultra vires, which loosely translates from the Latin to mean outside one's powers. Basically, the rule says that local governments are limited to the powers expressly granted to them by their state and are further limited to only those powers that are indispensable to the stated objectives and purposes of any particular local government. As Dillon himself put it in his famous ruling in City of Clinton versus the Cedar Rapids and Missouri Railroad in 1868, local governments are, quote, mere tenants at the will of their respective state legislatures, end quote. The bottom line is that, in Dillon's view, state authority trumps local authority so that state governments will always prevail when they engage a power struggle with local officials. Dillon's rule has structured the legal thinking about the power of local governments ever since, although it has now, as it had at the time of the ruling, its critics and opponents. One such critic, Thomas McIntyre Cooley, Chief Justice of the Michigan State Supreme Court, countered Dillon's rule just three years after Dillon's famous proclamation. In an 1871 case, People v. Herbold, Cooley held that, quote, local government is a matter of absolute right, unquote, and that, quote, the state cannot take it away, unquote. Additionally, in the 1870s, the Missouri State Legislature rewrote the state constitution specifically to allow municipalities a degree of independence from the constraints of state government. It appears that even Dillon himself understood the political peril of a rigid adherence to his rule. He felt that it would be a bad idea for state governments to take full advantage of their legal authority. It makes sense, Dillon conceded, for states to respect local autonomy because of cultural tradition and sheer practicality. Ultimately, then, as a legal matter, most scholars conclude that the relationship between state and local authority is more characteristic of a unitary arrangement than of a federal system, since local governments are created by state governments and their authority comes from the state rather than from the people. As a political matter, some local governments enjoy a good deal of autonomy over a number of functions, including taxation and the provision of public services. The question of which local governments may enjoy such autonomy is a matter of whether they are classified as general law or home rule jurisdictions.